one. All right, so if I remember correctly, the last thing that we did was Edith Wilson and the stroke, right? Woodrow Wilson mm -hmm. stroke. Does that sound correct? Yes. All right, what number did you have that as? I. 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 Uh, all right, we're gonna start a whole new unit with you guys. Um, we're gonna start a whole new unit. We're gonna call this the Roaring Twenties, the name of the unit. So we're gonna start over with A. We're gonna leave Edith Wilson with our World War I unit. And so that unit is this. Okay. All right, so the Roaring Twenties um, should be unit four, I think, right? Unit four, Roaring Twenties. Yep, we'll go with that. All right, unit four, Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties is uh, the period of the 1920s. And it's a period of, um, a period of uh, economic and cultural change period of economic and cultural change. The war is over and people are happy. People are just happy to have the war over. People are happy to be moving on with their lives. And we're gonna get a couple of big changes happening in the country at this time period. Um, but they're not like, they're not like a big event, right? Like a war is an event with like a set time, you know, it starts at this time and it ends at this time. These are all like trends that happen over the course of the whole Right, so these aren't like set events. These are more like trends. All right, so um, one of the biggest trends and the one that we're gonna, we're gonna focus the most on today is the changing gender roles in the country. Okay, so one of the biggest changes in the country is changing gender roles. We're gonna spend today talking about um, how women and the role of women changed during the 1920s, particularly women during the 1920s, okay? All right, so um, first of all, women are voting now. Women start the, start the decade off with the 19th Amendment, women are voting, hooray, this is awesome. Once women get the vote, women start to also look at a cultural change, okay? So first line down, you say women start by voting the new, um, the new decade, they start by voting, which leads into these cultural changes. Okay, what do these cultural changes look like? The cultural changes are, uh, we can see the appearance here, right? Short hair, short skirts. Short hair, short skirts. We're also gonna get women who are um, dancing in public in like more provocative ways. They're like, you know, shaking their booties and stuff, right? Um, we're also going to get women for the first time ever smoking and drinking in public. Drinking is illegal, so the drinking in public thing is a little bit tricky. But smoking in public is definitely a new thing. Prior to this point, women were not allowed to smoke. They weren't allowed to smoke. It was deemed like dirty and, and unladylike. It was also too much like sex, right? Because she would have a cigarette in her mouth and it would be reminiscent of like, Yes, right? And so it was, it was viewed as crude. It was viewed as like pornography to have a woman with a cigarette in her mouth. Um, women were also, it was against the law to cut their hair short at, at this point, right? In, in a lot of places. And women were also required to wear dresses that went all the way down to their ankles. And the women of the 20s are not doing it. They're cutting their skirts short. They're bringing them you know, up to the knees and stuff, right? And they're cutting their hair, they're doing a bob, right? Um, and we're getting a, a new statement where the women are coming out and they're saying, look, we're politically equal. We can do what we want to do. This is a bold new world for womankind. Now, technology is going to change things a lot. And we're going to talk about some technology in a moment but this is going to be the first time that we have recorded music. It's the first time we have recorded music. It's the first time we have radio. Um, it's the first time we have movies. Hollywood is gonna, is rising up and getting, and getting big here, right? So women are now being put into movies. They're being put on, you know, the radio. They're getting put into recorded music, right? And so we're gonna start getting women's voices showing up all around the place, around the world, around the country, right? And 
at this moment in the beginning there's this energy about everything where like there's no rules nobody knows what's going on everything can happen right later on they're going to start like regulating this stuff and stomping down on it and women's voices are going to get squashed later on but for this moment for this brief moment for this period of five or six or ten years women are basically almost equals in Hollywood and they're almost equals on the radio and they're almost equals in recording music, right? It's not until later, once that stuff starts making big money that the women start getting torn down, right? But for a moment, it looks great. Um, we're gonna come back to some of this stuff later. All right, um, one of the things that, one of the words that you need is flappers, flappers. Flapper is a term for the women who dress like these pictures here. It's a term for young women who dress in short skirts, short skirts, and they drink and they smoke and they dance. All right, this is a picture from the 1920s. This one on the right is actual 1920s. This is a modern picture of people dressing up like that, you know? Um, but this is what they actually wore back then. All right. Um, the other big deal that we need here is divorce. For the first time ever in world history, women have the right to divorce. Women gain the right to divorce. So divorce is one of these things that students oftentimes kind of see as difficult, right? You guys in the modern world probably think of divorce in a very different way, right? Maybe your parents are divorced. Assuredly, you know a lot of people whose parents are divorced, right? I'm sure, I'm sure half the people you know have divorced parents, I'm sure, right? Um, and, and so a lot of these students have a hard time seeing this, right? That we oftentimes think of divorce as something like sad and stressful and dramatic, right? Like tearing a family apart or causing troubles and stuff. But divorce is really, really important for women's rights. So I want you to put in your notes, the next line down, put a bullet point. Divorce is important for women's rights because, and we're gonna make a list of reasons why it's important. All right, so both of you, let's have both of you guys unmute your microphones so we can have a conversation. That way we can have an actual conversation. Unless you're, unless you're busy, unless you have stuff around you. But all right, Sam, start us off. Why is why is divorce so important for women's rights? Um, because they can get out of abusive of uh, out of abusive relationships. That's good. Let's put that as our number one, right in our bullet points, that women can get out of an abusive relationship. Men and women are both in abusive relationships. There's a lot of abuse going on, and of course women can you know beat up men and women can assault men and hurt men but the numbers are clear here men are doing much more of the violence a lot more right women men are doing the violence like 12 to 1 right so i'm not saying women can never be violent i'm just saying they aren't usually right so that's one that's a big one women can escape violence or abuse okay what else fernanda What's another reason why it's important? Um, I guess back then when they got married, they would. Um, uh, okay, sorry. Back then they would. My mic is not working really well, but back then they would get like when they would get married, they would like the husband would own them like as property, and so now they can like live on their own. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. So let's put women can, women can control their own life. Let's put that, women can control their own life. The um, men owning them like property is mostly a myth, Fernanda. That's not actually real. It's not actually real, but students tell me that every year, right? It's not actually real. Um, so women don't have the right, in a lot of cases, they don't have the right to own property. Like they can't own a house, they can't own the business, right? They, they have limited rights to own property. Um, and men have a lot of control over women in a, in a lot of ways, but it's not property. 
especially in a class where we talk about slavery, we need to be really careful when we talk about this because slavery is property. Like slavery is a person being owned as property, right? Marriage is not, marriage is something different. Okay, so what else is important about divorce? Why is divorce such an important right? We have escape abuse. We have women can control themselves. Generally speaking, who's happier in marriage, men or women? As a general rule, like if we do a survey of all the married people in the city. Probably. Yeah, why are men, and the answer is yes, men, and it's men by a large margin, right? It's something like three to one, men think marriage is great and women think marriage is not so great, right? So why are men so much happier with marriage than women? This is true today and it's true in 1920. Okay, so it's true both. Sure. Why are men so much happier in marriage? What do you think? Well, come on now. Sam, you said men, so why, what's your instinct? Is it right with the, like, the whole, like, they kind of get a pick with, like, proposing? Mm, I don't know where you're going with that. I, I, I don't think I understand what you're saying. Like with, with mainly with the like proposal of like, like you don't usually see like a woman propose to a guy. Like it's almost like the, the guys make like the final step of like, yes, I love you. I want to. It's not like in that same way of like woman, like get down on the knees saying like, will you marry me versus like guys who like go down. Okay. So that's kind of men taking control, I guess. Yeah. Men making the choice, right? What else? I, I want to get away from engagement and wedding and go marriage, right? So like if we ask everyone who's been married for five years, let's say, right? The men almost three to one are going to say that they're happy and the women will say no, they're not happy. Why is that? What do we think? Is it because of like staying home and stuff? Okay, so some of it is staying home, right? The, put it as our number three on here. Women are oftentimes not happy in marriage because for them, marriage is kind of like a second job. Who's doing the cleaning of the house? Usually the women. Who's taking care of the kids? usually the women who is you know making the dinner usually the women right this is not always true and good happy healthy marriages have both people be partners right where they split these things but what we have found is that men basically always think that they are doing their share of the work where the women are actually doing two or three times as much work right? That men just oftentimes aren't even aware of how much work needs to be done. Like they just aren't even aware of it. They just don't even know, right? Where the women are just doing a whole bunch of other stuff. So women are oftentimes not very happy. And so as it turns out, a lot of women would like to be single. And a lot of women don't want to be moms. And a lot of women want to have a job, right? Not everyone, and I'm not saying that you have to be that to be happy, but a lot of women do, okay? Here's what we need on here. This cultural change is gonna take decades. You're dealing with some really deep cultural change here, right? The idea of men and women, the idea of gender roles is like a really, really basic component of humanity, right? This is like, deep in our reptile brain, right? Like our entire society is based on this concept of men and women having these different roles and it takes a long time to change this. Okay, we still haven't changed it fully, um, but it's gonna take decades before we make really big progress. The 1920s are the first big step towards that progress though, okay? And it may seem silly to say that dressing like this is progress, but it absolutely is, right? Dressing like this, 
this is a woman in charge of her life. This is a woman in charge of the way she looks, in charge of going out on her own. Like she doesn't need a man to give her permission to go, right? She's in charge. She, can, she wants to show her arms, she can show her arms. She wants to show her legs, she can show her legs. This is a woman taking ownership of her own body, taking an ownership of her own life. This is, this is an important step. And it's a step that women were largely denied before. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. All right. So let's go to our next big number. So this would all be, uh, so A would just be the 20s, right? A is the era of change, the 20s. B is women. So let's go to C. Oh, I'm sorry. Keep this in part of B. I'm sorry. I forgot about this slide. This is a good one. Keep this as part of B. Part of this, like women gaining, gaining their independence is we're going to see a lot of women's going to start to step up and do men's work and, and do like men's stuff. Okay. So Amelia Earhart is the most famous example of this. Um, what is she famous for doing? Who is she? What is she famous for doing? She's probably the one that you guys both know. She's an airplane pilot. She's an airplane pilot. What is she famous for doing? She did a long airplane flight and then got lost. I'm okay. Scared. So she's famous for dying, right? She's famous for dying, right? Do you know, Fernanda, do you know what her accomplishment was? No. Okay. Didn't her most famous accomplishment is to cross the Atlantic. She's the first woman to cross the Atlantic in an airplane. Okay. The first woman to cross the Atlantic in the airplane, and as she was flying around the world in a later journey, she crashed and died somewhere in the world. Okay. Amelia Earhart is going to become a super celebrity in this time period. And she's going to stand out as this, you know, daredevil woman who is this pilot. Um, there's an assignment on Canvas about Amelia Earhart, and it features a bunch of other women who are doing this too. Like she's not alone, right? Um, there's a bunch of women who are doing this. This is going to become this new thing where the women are like, hey, we can do this stuff. Okay. My favorite example of this is a woman named Lillian LaFrance. Lily in the France. Now she is not a woman who shows up in a lot of history books normally, but I love her. She's great. Um, this is a drawing of her. Um, she's famous for a couple of things. She's a motorcycle daredevil, a motorcycle daredevil. And um, her motorcycle looks like this. It has these like swirly patterns on her wheels. You know, she also made the skull and crossbones um, famous as like a fashion statement. She would wear it on the front of her shirt. Like she sewed it onto her sweaters and stuff. Um, and she travels the country um, in, and she has she creates the wheel of death, right? Have you seen this on like motorcycles where you have like the big metal cage and the motorcycles are driving around it and driving around it and they go up and up and up. You guys know what I'm talking about? You seen that before? Mm -hmm. like the Say it again, Sam. They're like the metal ball cage things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the big metal like sphere, right? It's a big metal sphere and the motorcycles are driving around the inside. She's the one who invents that, right? It's kind of cool, huh? Like it's a woman from Kansas who invented this thing, right? Um, Americans are kind of always looking for like new ways to kind of, you know, almost kill ourselves. And, uh, you know, she figures out a cool new way to do that. Um, this is her driving a, she's driving a, a car with Lion in her car. <laughs> and she's driving around one of these big barrel things where she's gonna start going up on the sides with a lion in it, right? Um, I love Lily in France. I think she's so funny that she does this kind of stuff, right? Um, I think it's so interesting. As she becomes popular, one of the ironic things is, as she becomes popular, she's one of the pioneering um, people in this like daredevil realm. Um, she actually, gets so popular that men start copying her and they start making their own cages of death and stuff. And then eventually the women get pushed out of it. And so the men all say, whoa, this is too dangerous for women. Whoa, whoa, ladies, you need to stay to the side. It's too dangerous. Only men can do this, right? The ironic thing, of course, is that a woman invented it. And then the men all you know, take it over later. Okay, so this is part of our changing role. Now let's move to C. Big number C, Margaret Sanger and the birth control movement. All right, so birth control is maybe the number one most important women's rights issue 
in the history of the world. Let's start that off right now. Birth control is maybe the number one most important issue in women's rights in the history of the planet Earth, the history of the world. I do not think I'm exaggerating when I say that. Say it again, Sam. Can you say what you just said again? Yeah. Birth control is probably the number one women's rights issue in the history of the world. It's bigger than voting, it's bigger than divorce, it's bigger than property law, it's bigger than anything else. This is it. This is the whole enchilada. I do not think that I am exaggerating when I say this. I, I think I'm being accurate. Why, what's the argument in favor of birth control being so important? Do we know what birth control is? Do we, give me a thumbs up. Do you both understand what birth control is? So why is it so important historically speaking? Why does it matter so much? Yeah, Sam? Um, may, like probably with like parenthood, like probably like abortion will probably go, abortion will go down a lot or like probably just like the like abandoned children also will like probably like probably really go down because it's like okay. there won't be like mistakes that like keep on coming because of the birth control. Okay. So birth control as a broad concept usually includes abortion. Abortion is, is it's in the broad category of, of birth control. This would include everything from like condoms to, you know, the pill to surgery to abortions, all of that stuff is linked to that. Okay. So why is this so important. Think about the equality of men and women, right? Can we, um, can we see evidence where evidence that men and women are both equally smart? Do we have evidence that men and women are both equally smart? It's relatively easy to see that evidence, right? Relatively easy. Like you can just have a conversation with a man and a woman and you can see that they're equally smart, right? Can we tell that men and women are equally good or equally evil? Right? Can a woman be just as evil as a man? Yes. Yeah. Can a woman be just as good as a man? Yes. Sure. Can both men and women be good um, violin players? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's no reason to believe otherwise, right? Can both men and women work in a factory? Yes. Yes. Can they both be doctors? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can they both be homeless people? Yes. Okay. How about um, beautiful? Yes. Yeah. Right? So there's a lot of things in, in many, many ways. We can just go down this list, right? And this list is gonna be men and women can be equal in all of these different ways, right? I can give you hundreds and hundreds of things and you'll say, yes, they're equal, right? What's the one thing that men and women can never be equal with? Birth. There's one thing. What'd you say, Sam? Birth. Childbirth, right? Men and women can never be equal in childbirth, right? Does that make sense? Women will always be the ones giving birth and men will always be the ones not giving birth. That's just the way it is. That's, that's how biology works, right? In that way, we can never be equal. Okay, so in your notes, make sure you say here, we can fix society, we can fix politics, we can fix economics to make women equal in schools or equal in work or equal in politics. Like we can do that. We can never make women and men equal in childbirth, okay? This means that there's one thing that men and women can do that they will never be equal in, sex. 
since the dawn of time, since the very beginning of the human race, men have had the ability to have sex without consequences. Right? Men can just have sex with somebody, and then if she gets pregnant, the man just leaves. Right? They've always been able to do that since the beginning of time. Men have been able to just leave. And women couldn't do that. Margaret Sanger is the birth control activist, and she recognizes this. She says that unless women can have consequence-free sex, women have to be able to have sex without the fear of pregnancy. Unless they can do that, they will never, never be equal. So she publishes this uh, newspaper, Birth Control Review, where they publish all sorts of articles about birth control from different people, from Sanger and from all different scientists and different people, and they get talking about it. Sanger also founds the organization Planned Parenthood. This is an organization. Let's define Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is the largest women's health organization in the United States. The largest women's health organization in the United States. Largest what? Women's health organization. Okay. So Planned Parenthood as an organization is still today, still is today. Um, it starts back in the 1920s. Planned Parenthood is the largest organization where women go to to get birth control, like prescriptions for birth control. It's where they can get like um, gynecological visits. It's where they can do things like cancer screenings for like ovarian cancer or cervical cancer or breast cancer. Um, it's where they can do uh, abortions. Abortions become legal later on. They can do abortions. It's where they can do anything related to women's health. Okay, sexually transmitted diseases, anything related to women's health. And Margaret Sanger recognizes that women's health is woefully inadequate in the United States, right? And so this is her first step to doing this. Okay, birth control, the birth control pill, like the hormone pill that, that women take, right? That pill is not gonna be invented until 1961. But this is the beginning of the movement where they're trying to create birth control for the women. No matter how free you make women, no matter how much you make their vote or money or property or anything else, you can't solve women's equality without solving the baby, the problem with the baby. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. All right. Um, let's do this last one really, really quick. E or D is a D. I think D, right? D. Okay. Big number D is appliances, household appliances. The 1920s is where we invent a bunch of new appliances, including the washer, washing machine. Look at that thing. Oh, the washing machine, the refrigerator, and the vacuum cleaner. These are Wait, what? Say it again. What's the second uh, on the picture? The middle one is a refrigerator. Oh. Yeah. This is the invention of the refrigerator and the washing machine and the vacuum cleaner, right? This may seem like a kind of a silly thing, but this is a major, major change for people's lives, right? Right? I mean, these, these things change your life. You're now able to clean your clothes at home. You're now able to store food in your home for the first time. You're now able to like clean the floors without having to sweep it. The result here is that there's two results. The first result is that women actually spend more time cleaning the house. Ironically, you would think the machine makes things easier, but it doesn't. So women actually spend more time cleaning the house because they're now doing more chores, right? Where they used to sweep the floor every two or three days, now they're vacuuming every day. They used to wash the clothes every couple of weeks, now they're washing the clothes every couple of days. So it increases the chores, 
that women are doing. That's one. And number two, Americans are going to go into debt buying all these new things. All right, um, that's where we're gonna leave off. My 12th graders are already in the waiting room. So do you guys have any questions about these changing roles of women? Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording now.